Whew. Yeah. Nitro number 166, November 9th, 1998. The show opened with a video saying the line between pro wrestling and politics was very blur very blurry. Just wait, people. Just wait. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, they said, would start a campaign for president tonight. And why not? <laughs> Bobby Heenan and Gene Oakland were backstage awaiting, and I quote, the president of the United States. Yeah. So, in The Observer, Dave said that they promised that Bill Clinton would show up. Mm -hmm. Never. They never said Bill Clinton's name. They no. said president. They said the president of the United States of the United States was going to be here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so, two limos pull up, the NWO guys get out, they all fight with each other, and it led to nothing. Can I add, by the way, that I couldn't even believe this. So, at the beginning of the show, they announced the president of the United States is going to show up tonight. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure everybody was presuming it was bullshit, but maybe there was like that little tiny little part of them that thought, you know what? Maybe for some reason, like the president will do the Tonight Show or whatever. Jay Leno has been on the show. Maybe. You know what I mean? They were in New York. It is believable Bill Clinton will want to introduce himself to Miss Elizabeth. And bye -bye -bye. then... Mm -hmm. Gene announces that the NWO has reported that the president is going to be on Nitro. Why would you do that? I mean, can you possibly give away that is bullshit any more than that? And everybody involved looked like such an idiot for believing the NWO that the president was going to be on Nitro. We got like five minutes of Bret Hart highlights. Who went to Guerrero? Oh, there was there was a lot of highlights. Did there we mention Hall attacking Nash? Well, the NWO fought. Yeah. Did we mention a thousand fanny packs running to make the save? <laughs> I, did not, I, I didn't know. I could not believe how many fanny packs. I've never seen a segment with more fanny packs than this one right here. Every fucking guy running up had a fanny pack on. There was like 35 fanny packs in one segment. <laughs> I haven't seen that many fanny packs at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> then, yes... Every Bret Hart highlight from his entire career here. Juventud Guerrero versus Kaz Hayashi. Oh, my God. Dude. First, they cut away from the match so Eric Bischoff can ambush the announcers <sighs> and say, Over the house, Mike. The president will be here tonight. And there was also a bullshit finish, but at least... I, I thought it was going to be like the TNA pay-per-view where there was a match going on, but they focused on other stuff the entire time. These guys got like five minutes in between. Actually, more went through a commercial break. They had a long time to wrestle. Dude, they had, they had a long match. Yeah. And it hit me. In a lot of ways, this was very similar to like a modern ROH match. Yeah. But the, the biggest difference was Kaz got like three or four minutes to do his stuff. And then Hoovy got three or four minutes to do his stuff. Unlike ROH, where they just take turns move after move after move. And everything is countered right away. So this actually felt like a fight where one guy was winning. And then the tables were turned. And the other guy had the advantage for a while. Dude, this match was so great. And it has to be... I mean, maybe there's another one, but I'm pretty sure this was the best match I've ever seen that got a boring chant. Yeah, there was one guy. How in the fuck? And they were shitting for Goldberg and shit like that. This match was so good and nobody cared. Yeah. And then out comes Ernest fucking Miller. Cat and Sonny Ono come out. Cat takes the ref. Ono kicks Kaz in the face. I've heard that Ernest Miller is a three-time karate champion. That is the gimmick. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Ono kicks Kaz in the face, and Hoobie wins with a, with a roll-up. So the karate champion didn't kick him in the face. His manager did. Well, his manager is also a karate champion. I see. Yes. He, 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 he emphasized this, and he's been saying he's the, he is the undefeated, uh, he's undefeated and the best Japanese wrestler in, uh, in WCW. You know, I have never seen a match so good that filled me with so much hate. That's fair. It was astonishing. Between Bischoff coming out and mm -hmm. boring chants and this bullshit finish and the shat, it was just shit. We got a replay of the angle where Nash was thrown through a wall and disappeared. That was a good angle. <laughs> Alex Wright versus Barry Horowitz in a match I thought we had just seen. But no, it was Barry Horowitz versus Disco Inferno. I love that Alex Same Wright thing. comes out and says, I demand complete silence for my match with Barry Horowitz. Specifically, Brian, what he said was, he did not want to hear any Alex Wright chant sucks. <laughs> Alex oh, yeah. Wright chant sucks? That's what he wants. That's what he said. So, yes, the announcer explained, and this is also a quote, Alex Wright demands total silence 
so he can devote complete attention to defeating Barry Horowitz. Well, luckily he's not over, so laughed, no problem. And I laughed, and I laughed. So, I hope you wrote down the finishes for this show. Oh, I did. <laughs> so, Secret Service dudes right there at ringside now. They start brawling on the floor. The wolf pack howl sounds. Just, oh, yeah. Just the howl. And everyone looks around. And then the wolf pack comes out. And then the wolf pack music plays. Nash comes out so pissed off. <laughs> because they just... They can't even play fucking music right. <laughs> it's coming out. They play the music. And it was just... This was so incredible. Nash gets in the ring. And he's acting all friendly to Barry. And he pats him on the ass. Yeah. Gives him the old thumbs up. Hit the showers, kid. Sends him packing. I'm like, you're such a dick. <laughs> like, they came out to announce matches for later. Uh-huh. Kinda. They wouldn't allow Barry Horowitz to finish his match. No. It's like, your match is not important. You're a jabroni. They were right. But we're gonna way. be, like, really nice to you. We're gonna pat you on the ass and give you a thumbs up and everything like that. It's just, it was just like, I, I don't know. What, so, I don't even care. There was no, I don't know why I'm even caring. There was no bell. They just left, and these guys started talking. Conan did his catchphrases. Nash quoted Popeye. Challenged anyone from the black and white, but especially Scott Hall. Luger calls out Brett. Bischoff comes out. Nash repeatedly calls him Estrogen Boy. Yeah. Was there an inside joke here, Brian? I'm sure there was, but I don't fucking know what it was. You know what this was? When you're sitting in your dad's chair watching his TV and he gets home from work and then basically you just have to get out of his way. Oh, I'm in dad's chair. I got to move. Here's the... here's So the, who's dad here? The, end, the wolf pack? Absolutely. I see. Okay, that's fine. So Bischoff and Nash go back and forth and when it was done, I wrote Bischoff booked. Then I realized I didn't know what had happened. I think a six man? Well, he just promised that they would face the black and white tonight. Would it be that hard for him to specify it here? No. Yes. They probably hadn't written it yet. <laughs> well, it was announced after the break. It would be Conan versus Bret Hart. And Nash and Luger versus Giant and Hall. Lodi versus Scott Norton. Oh, I was kidding. You know what's funny about this is every time WWE fucks somebody up and I say, you know what? All you have to do is just let him go out there and kill some folks and win a lot. Yeah. And everybody goes, not everybody, but, you know, the usual crew, that doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work. Or whatever. You can't do that. You can't blah, 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 blah. It fucking works every time I see it. Mm -hmm. Scott fucking Norton out here Scott's was like the biggest star on the show because he came out and destroyed Lodi. Scott has been a mid-card at best guy for the entire Nitro run. An NWO black and white geek faction member. Yes. Yeah, you're right. That's correct. But he comes out here. It's been like a month now. He destroys guys in a minute. Looks like a monster. Hits a big giant power move and pins him. He wrath. Also works with Wrath. It fucking works for everybody. The big New Japan gold belt doesn't hurt either. So he is introduced while well, the announcers call him the IWGP world champion. That does in fact help. He destroyed Lodi with a power bomb in like 10 seconds. And between this monster push he's getting here and the fire and ice feud with the Steiners, really hit me how underrated Scott Norton is in the Monday Night He's Wars. awesome. He's awesome. This next segment. You're all going to think I'm lying about what happened. If you told me well, this I'm happened not. before I watched the show, I said, bullshit. You must have watched the wrong program. <laughs> the Disciple comes out for a promo. Gene, calls, Gene says, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Disciple. And you can hear the crowd, all 10,000 people kind of go, uh. Disciple comes out. It's Brutus Beefcake in 1998. There are beefcake chants. He gets as far as saying he is his own man when out comes the biggest crew of losers. The B team to end all B teams. Stevie Ray, Horace, and Vincent. And they come out to interrupt. And I'm just looking at these four men. Beefcake, Stevie Ray, Horace, and Vince. Hey, think about this. It's Horace, Vincent, and Stevie Ray. Okay? As stated. You're the booker. That. <laughs> You're the booker. Okay. Somebody needs to go back and forth with the disciple. I disagree, but okay. Who do you choose of those three men? 
It's got to be Stevie Ray, right? Yeah. yeah. The, I ol- think so. the yeah. only guy that can cut anything resembling a decent promo. Uh-huh. Sure. Well, who do these fuck faces choose? It was Horace. Horace. Actually, it wasn't the worst choice. It, it was, was it was the middle choice. Yeah. It was they the figured wrong out choice. they figured out not Vincent. There was a wronger choice. But this is the wrong choice. Horace notes that he was bigger, tougher, and uglier than the disciple. That's what he <laughs> because said. you know that's you know part of the That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> disciple then tells Horace, quote, get out of my face before I rearrange it. Yeah. He's gonna rearrange his own face? <laughs> yeah. Get well, out of already my face once. before I rearrange it. So Horace attacks Disciple and Janae says, Ah, oh, this was a pre-planned attack. You think? This goes on for he a while. He is the professor. Brutus Beefcake makes his comeback in 1998. The NWO eventually swarms him with one of the worst dis- offensive displays I can recall. Do you remember, Brian, when you and I had a match with Buddy Wayne and Richie Magnet, and they told you to tell me whatever he was doing with his arm, stop it? Yes. I believe the punches I was throwing at that match were very similar to what Vincent was doing here. Probably better. <laughs> I was in, like, my, I don't know, 20th match. Vince has been a pro in this for, like, decades at this point. Anyway, it sucks. And who should come out to make the save? I could not believe my eyes. <laughs> what is he doing here? He's back again. It's Warrior. He won't leave. <laughs> Well, actually, this was for real this time. The end. Are this you was sure? this was his last appearance. I'd have never come back too. Yeah, he ran down and he cleared the ring. And actually, he wasn't horrible clearing the ring, given his opponents. It was. But God, he, he sprints down that ramp, and by the time he throws his first clothesline, he is gasping for air. Yes. And the, they go to commercial as he is sticking his t-shirt in horse's mouth, whipping him in. And how much did he get paid for this one show? Well, I think, if I recall correctly, he got like a million dollars, and then they like signed him for another million, but they never used him. It was some like completely <laughs> like, preposterous This deal. is so random, so random and forgotten and pointless. The only thing I could figure was, they must have signed him to a deal with X number of dates, and they realized they had him for one more date, and goddammit, we're paying him, we're gonna book him. And they did this. What a segment. I, <laughs> none of the, nothing else makes any sense. Heenan and Gene were backstage watching a motorcade arrive. So it arrives. All right, here we go. Yeah. Up to this point, this has just been a nitro. (laughs) You know what? This was not even the stupidest thing on the show. But at the time, (laughs) I thought this was the stupidest thing I'd maybe ever seen. Beyond being the stupidest, it was quite clearly the worst. Which is more important. They never do it again, by the way. There have been stupid segments that have been fun. This is not fun. Think about this. It was so fucking stupid. Even they realized, let's not do it again. They didn't figure that out with the warrior. (laughs) Now, one other thing before you even recap it. Hulk Hogan is the top heel in this company, right? Should be, yeah. Clearly. Okay, well, what happened here? Well, first we had the motorcade arriving. Then they went back to the announcers. Then they go backstage where Secret Service is telling Gene and Bobby to step back. Then it goes back to the announcers. Then we get a mob of dorks in suits pushing the cameraman back. Then we go back to the announcers. It's just Larry, Tony, and Mike staring at the camera with puzzled expressions. This felt like it had already been 20 minutes in. Were they deliberately trying to lose this war? Did they all just want to retire and get out of this business and go home? Hail to the Chief begins to play. And out come Hogan and Bischoff. Dressed like an idiot, Eric notes. Or Larry noted, correct, correctly. He wasn't wrong. No. No. They hit the ring. Bischoff introduces Hogan as the next president of the United States. Got a flag dropping from the ceiling. Gene arrives to interview them. Hogan congratulates Jesse Ventura. Now, hold on here. Uh. Gene arrives. This was the most astonishing thing. <laughs> Gene arrives, and he's playing it straight. <laughs> yeah. He begins to interview Hulk Hogan about his presidential run in the year 2000. Hogan is sitting there. He congratulates Jesse. He's a true American. He says, Minnesota set a standard for this country. They chose a non-politician to put Minnesota back on track. 
I could not even believe this watching in 2017. By the way, he said this while wearing the most ridiculous white-rimmed glasses I've ever seen, <laughs> yeah, a stocking like, cap, yeah. and two feather boas, one black and one white. Like, think of how ridiculous he dresses every segment. And this was just a similar style, but cranked up to, like, 20. Dressed like an idiot. He was yeah, Larry like noted. Idiot. So then Hogan says, I got a ton of calls, including from Jesse, which I didn't pick up. <laughs> but I promise I'll call him back. I decided I am going to run for president. And if I could find one good American to run side by side with me, I'd do it. Whether it be Oprah or my brother Bubba. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my fucking. So to watch this in 2017, <laughs> yes. Hulk Hogan running for president, putting over his brother Bubba. Bubba the love sponge. By the way, they promised he would announce his running mate. He didn't. He said Bubba. Because apparently. In in the week that they'd come up with this idea, he could not legitimately find one person to even pretend that they would be Hulk Hogan's running mate. Nobody would do it. He had no running mate. And I swear to God, Gene Okerlund then fucking says, Hulk, are you going to run as a Republican or a Democrat? This had to be a shoot, right? I don't know. Hogan had no answer. He just starts bumbling around, committing to absolutely nothing. Maybe he didn't know that there was two political parties in, this, in the States. This was so god-awful. And it was long. It went on this forever. It started way back in that motorcade bit, and it went on through this promo. 20 minutes of my life, I will never, ever get back. <laughs> like, what did Hogan think was going to happen here? He was going to get cheered? He's the top heel. Out here acting like he's going to run for president and he's asking for our support? I don't know. <laughs> what the fuck was going on here? This was when I knew, like, dude's lost his mind. <laughs> he totally has lost his mind. And Bischoff has lost his mind. Everybody's lost their minds. The Nitro Girls went shopping. That was way better than this segment. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Bret Hart came out for a promo. He said he's not afraid of Luger. Have they played this music for Brett before? I don't think so. This music's awesome. Yeah. I remember, I do remember watching Nights with You at some point and I would have fan you were Brett's music and it's been a year now since Brett's been in WCW and his music wasn't that cool and this music was really cool. Yeah, this is this is like, it, it was is, new this week, It must right? be this one. It was like a takeoff on his WWE Yeah, this, game, is, this was, was great music. Better. So Brett says he's not afraid of Luger. Tell Sting to get well soon so he can hurt him again, I think. DDP might as well just FedEx the U.S. belt back to its rightful owner. FedEx. Uh -huh. He promised to take Conan out tonight and said the Nitro girls needed to start hiding. Yeah. What? Well, he said the <laughs> only he said. he said the only people not hiding from me are the Nitro girls, but they better start. So he's banging them. I don't know or what he something. Was, I don't know what he was insinuating. All I know is he's totally given up and he's awesome now. <laughs> <laughs> so he's banging them, but they should be really afraid. It's basically what he said. I don't know. Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. If these guys wrestled 10,000 times and you rank them from 1 to 10,000, this would be number 10,001. They did nothing. It's true. Well, I mean, I will give it a little bit of credit. Like, Eddie did a great job working over the leg. Like, if you want to see how to technically work over a guy's leg, like, this was a good match. But who the fuck wants to watch Eddie Guerrero work over Rey Mysterio's leg? And then, Rey did, like, a little bit of limping, but he's running during his comeback. He's jumping. Bobby Heenan says, and I quote, Can you imagine a one-legged man doing all these springboard moves? That's what he said. <laughs> I'm like, fuck no, I can't imagine that. It's like two indie guys out there. So, Eddie is wrestling in a shirt now. And it is the LWO shirt, so maybe he's just trying to get that over and push it. Why but... does it have to be so big? Well, I don't know what his physical condition was. Okay. I know he had injuries in WCW. I know he had substance abuse issues all the time. Okay. Between th that and the giant shirt and the way they did not, they did a two-minute match stretched out over like 15 minutes, maybe it's out of shape. I don't know. It would explain something. Boring chance for Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio Jr. And deserved. I don't blame these fans. Yeah, this was not like the opener. No. So six hours in, Chavo Guerrero runs out oh, with Hobby can, Horse. Why? God, it's just like they write this show to infuriate me. The match is bad enough, and then they send out Chavo Guerrero in his goddamn stick horse. Get out of here. 
<laughs> so stupid. And then Ray fucks up a roll up and has to. I mean, the roll up's a finish and he screws it up. Mm -hmm. So he does an Oklahoma roll. Like a shoot Oklahoma roll. Yes. Like he had to think on his feet and he just did a shoot Oklahoma roll and pin the guy. That was the only good thing about this match. So the LWO runs out to attack Chavo. Great. <laughs> Dude, I would have bought an LWO shirt on the spot if I would have been watching this in 98 and had any money. <laughs> but Ray pulled him out and they left together. God. Didn't give him enough of a beating. So to recap... The LWO united as a group because they're all sick of wrestling each other, and now they're feuding with other Mexicans still. Yeah, they're sick of wrestling each other. So, it makes sense. I guess. They want all the Mexicans on their side, so they have to wrestle somebody else. If you're a Mexican who, who, who is not on their side, they don't want to wrestle you, so they're going to beat you up. <laughs> it's the only logical thing you on the whole show. You had me the last sentence. It's the only logical thing on the whole show. No, they want to beat him up so bad he never wrestles again. I see. They don't want to beat him up to set up a feud. Now the best thing on the show. Conan music video. This was awesome. Oh my gosh. Oh, get out of here, Craig. Oh my gosh. This was so great. I don't know about that. Now it was hokey. The production was wacky. I mean... This was great, you said? Yeah, it was fun. Okay. This was, in fact... Conan's rapping. People rapping and dancing... And drive around the load riders and yep. work on the hydraulics. And it was great to see people on the show just having fun. God, for it was once. great. I had so much fun watching this. Yeah, it was fun to watch. To listen to? Not so much. Oh, Craig's get out of here, fan Craig. Of no, I don't mind Maybe rap. you'll do Pearl Jam next time. Then you'll like it. I know. I don't mind rap. I just think Conan is not a good rap. <laughs> oh, get out of here, you curmudgeon. Actually, now I want to hear Conan sing Pearl Jam. This was awesome. That's intriguing. This was great. What did he say? He wanted to be a fridge? A bus. A bus. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Something, something, I am a bus, I believe he said. <laughs> something along those lines. See, I loved it. It's not a good rap if you can't decipher it. Well, he did, it was, was freestyle, Craig. There was a lot of money. It was going freestyle. On. He did the best he could. They recorded a freestyle. Yeah. Okay. I just loved it. Like, Conan's just chilling out in places. <laughs> There's a funny line where, like, he's in a club. <laughs> he's in a club. And he's sitting in a, in a seat, like, way up on some bleachers or something, and the camera's nine miles away, and it's like the Rainmaker. Yes. It zooms right in on him, and he does a line. <laughs> like, who put this together? It's Conan! Awesome. What do you think put it together? And this next segment is where I just lost my mind. This was the dumbest segment in the history of professional wrestling. That's fair. In case any of you thought there was too much wrestling on the show... And we're hoping somebody would come out and bullshit for a while. I've got good news. Out comes Eric Bischoff and Miss Elizabeth. So Eric starts talking about Flair. He says, Flair is not going to wrestle tonight. He cannot pass the physical. He has no blood pressure. He has no heartbeat. That does sound serious. In Eric's defense, I wouldn't put him in the ring either. So then Eric says he's upset that J.J. Dillon had fined Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell. So he brought out some attorneys and a corporate controller. Because what I want from my pro wrestling show is politics, lawyers, and bureaucracy. I'm all fired up now. These three lumps of flesh get in the ring. They may as well just brought in three cadavers. They get through their lines. No humanity to them. No relatability. They, there's like un uncanny gap people. I'm not sure they were actual humans. <laughs> I was going to say, it was like he was beating up mannequins. Yeah, so... Dude, the mannequins would have sold better. So, Eric, his lawyers there, and one of the guys signed the checks, or took the money away. Who gives a shit? Just talk about what happened. So, Eric is mad at them, and he begins to kick their asses. He starts attacking attorneys. And a controller. What the hell With call the fucking lamest kicks you've ever seen. The worst selling you've ever seen. It's too bad one of them wasn't Joseph Park. Like, you know, when when, yes, when there's an is. assault backstage at a wrestling show involving the wrestlers, and you're like, shouldn't that guy, like, go to prison? Yeah. I mean, maybe, and I know this because the WWE weirdos get mad at me when I say this, but, like, you know, they're wrestlers. They want to get their own revenge. Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman, you know, Roman tries to kill the guy, but it's wrestling. They're wrestlers. You know, it's okay. 
These were fucking three attorneys and Eric Bischoff. This guy should be in prison for the rest of his life. Yes, because who is more litigious than a lawyer? <laughs> Just beats him up, leaves him laying, and then goes away. And these guys were so boring that when Eric beat them up, it got no reaction. No one cheered. No one booed. Nobody cared. Here I wrote, this fucking show fucking sucks, and I don't want to fucking watch it anymore. Then I realized... There's an hour to go. Dude. Well, it didn't help that B Bischoff threw the worst strikes, and these guys didn't sell good. You don't say. So Putting therefore, untrained performers in a wrestling ring and asking them to perform wrestling acts backfired? Huh. Right. That's why the crowd sat on their hands and didn't make any kind of noise whatsoever. Because it was phony. I rank And this, it was boring. I rank this worse than the Judy Bagwell segment. For sure. Okay. Yeah. Actually. Okay. Yeah. This was the stupidest segment. I'll tear that apart too, but this was worse. I actually think this was dumber than Warrior in the Mirror. I just, I, I hated this with every ounce of my being. It was so stupid. They recap Scott Steiner going crazy last week. And then Steiner attacking Rick, Rick Patrick on Thunder and nearly breaking his leg until Buff pulled him away. Excuse me. Rick Patrick? That was his name? Nick Patrick. Nick Patrick. Excuse me. Oh my me. God. He's just losing his mind. At this point, the fireworks for the third hour began, and it suddenly occurred to me, Bill Goldberg's still the world heavyweight champion, right? Because we're two hours into Nitro yet, and no one said his name. Well, it's a funny story. Apparently, apparently there was, uh, what the hell was the name of that movie? Universal Soldier? Mm -hmm. This is actually a big story, because apparently Universal Soldier wanted Steve Austin to be in the movie, and Vince turned them down, mm. and Vince told... Austin, they'd only offered him like $50,000 to do Universal Soldier. And then I guess Austin found out that Goldberg got the role afterwards and got $250,000. And Vin, and Austin was upset. Yes. And so Vince like shifted the blame to somebody else in the company. And it was a big rigmarole. And Vince eventually apologized. But I think Goldberg was filming the movie. But allegedly, like he got the role, but it was not supposed to interfere with his Nitro dates. And he was on this show. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on, is my point. So Steiner and Bagwell come out for a promo. The ref is out there, but he tells the announcer, no WCW officials will have anything to do with Scott Steiner matches from this point forward. It's unsafe. So Steiner cuts a promo about fucking a bunch of women. Buff says he and Scotty are rich enough to just buy their own referee. Steiner starts calling out Roddy Piper again, for Christ knows what reason. Demanded WCW send somebody out to fight him. Out comes Chris Adams. Geek of the Week, 1998. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is actually even a bigger geek than Kenny Chaos, because Adam saw what happened to Chaos last week. You'd think. He runs out there, and Buff and Scott just beat the fuck out of him. <laughs> beat him and beat him and beat him. Buff says, there's no ref, we can do what we want. They put him in the Steiner recliner. Finally, Rick Steiner runs out and chases them away. And Rick challenges them to a tag team title match, which had me very confused. Because Rick won the tag titles, but he won it in a tag match with Buff as his partner, but they took the titles off Buff, and so he gave it to Kenny Chaos. Mm -hmm. But now, Rick says, I'll find a partner. Right. So the tag team champions right now are Rick Steiner and whoever he can find on that particular day. It's well, like the free bird rule, except the, uh, <laughs> the applicant pool is the entire roster. He won them by himself, so I guess the story was he doesn't have a regular partner. And Kenny Chaos got beaten up, and so I guess the only person he could come up with was Judy Bagwell. Well, Brian, thank you for explaining that, because WCW did not. No. I did the best I could. I, 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 was, I, I, don't, I don't get it. An unbelievable Lex Luger video package aired. I hope we get more of these leading up to World War III. Michael Buffer, I'm certain, wrote this copy, and I wrote down the entire thing. To find the most well-conditioned athlete in wrestling, look no further than the total package, Lex Luger. His body is chiseled out of granite, and his mind is that of a scholar. Never backing down from a challenge, Lex uses his intelligence, along with his experience, to exploit his opponent. Always on the attack, he looks at the weaknesses on the other man and takes advantage of his flaws. His tremendous endurance enables him to wear the man down until that fateful moment when he puts him in the awesome torture rack. This year, he's looking for another shot 
at the world title. And there's like Southern Rock in the background as he's just put, putting dudes in the rack and flexing all day. And it was so ridiculously cheesy. You would think this would be a heel promo, but no, it was supposed to get Lex cheered. I guess it didn't hurt him, but it was so wacky. Hey, at least you were trying to get somebody over. That's right. Unlike the rest of this fucking show. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner versus Rick Steiner and a mystery partner. And yes, Judy Bagwell came out in her sweating to the oldie sweatsuit with a tag team championship belt around them. <laughs> and her goddamn earrings and in. Earrings. Okay, so listen. They bring out Judy Bagwell, okay? So let me repeat this. Steiner and Bagwell have challenged Rick to a match for the belts. Correct. Rick comes out with Judy. Judy Bagwell. Rick comes out with Judy Bagwell. Do we all got that? Okay. For some reason, this makes Scott and Buff furious. <laughs> They're furious that they need to challenge for the belts against Rick Steiner and Judy Bagwell. Why are they mad? So Judy gets in the ring. Rick goes after Scott. Buff Bagwell swings at his mother. Right. She yeah. ducks. She slaps him. He takes a bump, and the heels bail. Correct. Buff then says, this ain't happening. God damn it. <laughs> this is not happening. So, then, uh, <laughs> then, uh, do we got all that, by the way? Okay. That's what happened. Then the heels, after bailing out of the ring here, in their chance for a championship match against Rick and Judy Bagwell... They bow the they bow to the ring, and then they say, "You know what? We want this match for the titles at the pay per view." What? What? Why don't you take the fucking match right now? So, Rick is daring them to get in the ring. Hey, Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell, why don't you get your ass in the ring with myself and Judy Bagwell? But they won't. They've got to do it later. You know, this was really stupid, but it was not as stupid as the lawyers. It wasn't. I can at least hear, I can rationalize that Buff Bagwell doesn't want his mother anywhere near a wrestling ring. Right. Sure. So there, there, there's like, there's, there's straws here that can be grasped at. Yes. Not to mention, Buff wouldn't actually strike his mother even though he tried but he tried now can you imagine scott steiner this yes you can this is the what really this this is the stupidest thing about this right they spent a month saying scott steiner is an out of control homicidal maniac yes he's as crazy on this show as keen is on raw he just doesn't have gasoline or fire fingers but he'll kill anyone at any time including apparently roddy piper and jj dylan so your plan your dragon slayer to stop this monster is to get a middle-aged woman with earrings. Middle-aged. That's very yeah. generous, fans. Yeah. Now, you can rationalize this in another way. It's not elderly. You can rationalize this in another way. Kind of. <laughs> Rick Steiner <laughs> knew that Buff was not going to really beat up his mom. Right. That's why he brought her out here. However, that doesn't explain why when they do the rematch of the pay-per-view, he's going to bring Judy out again. Then they'll have a plan. <laughs> but see... At least Bagwell and Steiner, at least when they bailed, they sort of rationalized it by saying, listen, okay, we gave you a chance. We are not going to give you a chance next time. Although, their heels, why don't they just beat up Judy? Or, right? why do they want Rick to get a tougher partner? Or, why isn't the story that Steiner is more than happy to kill Judy Bagwell, but Buff is protecting his mother? I don't know. This thing sucks. It really sucks. But it was not as stupid as the lawyers. I no. stand by that. I concur. Conan versus Bret Hart. They didn't mention that it would be a special Tuesday edition of Nitro next week. And oh, hey, by the way, Goldberg, the world champion, will be on it. No graphic for this. No video package. No promo. Just the announcers whispering it during Conan's ring entrance. They started brawling on the floor. I swear to God, I thought they were going to do a double count out in 10 seconds. There's no doubt in my mind it was going to happen. Instead, they're doing this match. It's okay. It's mostly boring. It's Brett working the leg. Crowd demands Sting, who was on the show but still got the biggest reaction of the night. 
And then Brett attacked Conan with a chair for the DQ. Stupid. What in the fuck? The only good thing about this is he destroys Conan's leg with the chair. And <laughs> Conan is lying in a heap like the rock. Laying on his side. Yes. Half dead. And the ref goes over and makes sure to raise his hand. <laughs> this man's the victor, everybody. <laughs> he needs his hand raised. I like... Lex runs out to make the save and Brett flees. So Lex grabs three geeks and says, let's get Conan to the back. And they don't, like, throw his arms over their shoulders and he walks out of, walks out of one leg. Four guys get together and they all reach over and grab each other's arms and Conan just falls into their arms, making a human chair. And they carry him to the back like it's a cheerleading stunt or something. That made me laugh. As this is going on, Gene is getting in the ring for his next promo segment. He points at the floor here where Conan's been mutilated and just says, this happens very frequently. So Gene brings out Chris Jericho for a promo. That was a funnier line, but it's in this segment, actually. So Jericho came with a pro uh, with a hairdo that had the announcers all a tizzy in 1998, but let me tell you something. I've probably seen 20 different crazy haircuts on Enzo Amore alone Yeah. than on this. Mm -hmm. He just teases hair up and uses a bunch of hairspray. He looked exactly like my daughter going down a slide. That's actually true. Yeah. Can imagine him saying, "Turn off the fan, man." <laughs> well, it's funny you brought up modern day Jericho, as we'll get to here. So Jericho cleaned to be four up four and zero on Goldberg. He hey, knew. he mentioned it was his birthday today. Twenty eight well, years ago today, I was yeah. born right here in Long Island, which was true. That's true. Mm -hmm. It was his birthday. He said he knew Goldberg wasn't there tonight. Kept calling him Greenberg. So he knew Goldberg wasn't there because Ralphus had told him. Oh. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> what, a, what a great source. They cut Ralphus. Back, they cut backstage where Goldberg had apparently just arrived at the building. He's carrying his bag and his belt. <laughs> this, You know, let me explain what happened back here. <laughs> Goldberg is watching on backstage, and the best way to describe it is he was gotten to. Yes. Yeah. He just, he could not take any more trolling. I don't think it was Jericho's, I, the, the idea was Jericho didn't know he was there. So it was an accidental gotten to by Jer on Jericho's part. Right. But yes, there was a monitor in Goldberg's room, and he saw Jericho making fun of him, calling him Greenberg, and saying he was 4-0, and, and Goldberg was totally gotten to. And he kicked in a door and started throwing couches around. Mm -hmm. And he goes to the, uh, storm storms to the backstage area and goes out on stage. And the camera, like, all you can see, it's almost behind him, and all you can see is the back of his head. And it's like, what's going on? And finally, they cut to another view. You can see Jericho was backing his way up the aisle. And everyone can tell it was going to happen. And it was awesome. It's, it's one of those where swerves are usually bad. Tease something, make people want it, and then deliver. Mm -hmm. Jericho's backing up towards Goldberg. And he's closer and closer. He turns around. And Bill Goldberg speared Chris Jericho back to Winnipeg. He <laughs> ran ahead of steam. And he just fucking destroyed this guy he hit him so hard the hairspray flew out of his hair <laughs> and it was straight again by the time he hit the floor you know it was great they <laughs> the showed spear. replay after replay after replay in the slow best. motion it was so awesome and then tony shivani in the middle of this carnage describes goldberg by saying yes. and i and i quote yes. he wrestles very angrily <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> He's not wrong. This is so awesome. So the other highlight of this, besides the multiple angles and the slow motion, and he hit, he speared Jericho and he went up. <laughs> Just destroyed him. <laughs> and Goldberg stomps to the back and Jericho's down on the ground grabbing his ribs, ribs, writhing in pain. At which point Bobby Heenan said, seriously, I'm not making this up. I think Chris Jericho just made the list. Yes, he said that. In man, the irony man. of all ironies. Chris Jericho's most successful gimmick was stolen from Bill Goldberg. <laughs> Amazing! Main event, Scott Hall and Giant versus Kevin Nash and Lex Luger. Hideously boring main event. You hey. know what? Giant's got one foot out the door with his company. He's going to leave. Mm -hmm. And yet he wasn't the laziest guy in the match. Nash was. Nash was very, All I very know, lazy. He didn't take one bump. Of course not. All I know is, this is better than last week's giant match. Barely. So... You know, maybe the most angry about the match wasn't even the match itself, but in the middle of this boring main event, at the end of a three-hour show, 
that absolutely sucked, they fucking announced that tomorrow night there's a special one-hour edition of Nitro on Tuesday. I was like, like, what? In case you haven't had enough? An extra hour? Why? I guess sweeps. So, eventually Nash gets a hot tag. He does what he can do, the five things he's got. And then Brett runs in and attacks him for the disqualification. Fuck off. (laughs) So, Lex grabs a chair. He chases the NWO away, and the show ends. The finish is on this show, Brian. Yes, tell me. Pinfall after outside interference. No finish because the Wolfpack wanted to cut a promo. Clean pin. Pin after a man was kicked into his own nephew. Intentional DQ by a guy who was winning. And DQ due to outside interference. And the most amazing thing, rather than how good or bad those finishes are, there's only six of them. Yeah, in three It's a three-hour show. It's not like there was an Iron Man match in there. No. There were long stretches of non-wrestling bullshit in the show. This is a really bad show, and it only gets worse. It can't be true. It is. I know it is. But were you watching be- it like every single week back then, or did you miss stuff or take time off? Do you remember? I would definitely watch more than I missed. Oh, well, you're going to watch it all again. I, watched, I, I, I miss a... I, I remember because I did miss the uh, Arn Anderson's retirement speech. I was very upset because I was like, the one Nitro I missed, and that's the one. So out of the 52 shows a year, I watched at least 45 or so. Dude. Well, you're going to be an expert within the next three years. And keep in mind, we only have to do this for three more years, Vinny, and then they're dead. (laughs) So that's it. At least there is an end date. Unlike with the three-hour Raws today, which are going to go on forever at this rate. All right, everybody. That's it. Friday night. Yeah, we got I know, Craig. Big Friday dudes. night is a Defy show. Where's it at? I it's don't at even the know. Washington Hall. Washington Hall in Seattle. Very, very cool building. Yep, very cool. No one under 21, though. Correct. I've been told. Yes, I will be there cornering Filthy Tom. Oh, yeah. I'm keeping an eye out on this guy. Filthy Tom is wrestling all ego Ethan Page. Yeah. Also on the show. Rough night for that young man. Also on the show, Shane Strickland against Brody King. We got Sammy Callahan wrestling ravenous Randy Myers. This guy owns. Sorry, owns his gimmick. That's true. I can vouch for that. What he's a big eater. Ravenous Randy is turned on by everything. I guess that's one way to put it. Huh. He's a weird, creepy guy who who does. He's as weird and creepy as he can possibly be at all times. This I can vouch for. He is amazing. And uh, he's facing Sammy Callahan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's gonna be a rough night for him too. Oh yeah. And uh, also Jessica Havoc versus uh, Malaya Hasaka. Wow. Yeah. My dream match I never got. That's right. Damn it. Also, Come Hungry, Lunchbox Laboratory is uh, bringing a food truck. These guys, Lunchbox Laboratory, pretty legit. Is Craig telling you this, everybody? Well, the one time Vinny and I went was bad. (laughs) Hell of a plug. plug. Remember that, Vince? I do. I got the uh, homage to Dix Deluxe, which was Kobe beef slathered with American cheese, which is not a good combo. But what are you if, talking about? It sounds awesome. Well, then we got here and you teased us because we wouldn't eat pizza. Okay, I don't remember that part. I don't remember that part either. Oh, What's I he totally talking about? This part. Why and, would there have been pizza here on a Tuesday night? It wasn't a Tuesday, Brian. It was, it was pay-per-view or something. I think we came over for an ROH show. You it was, did? It was years ago. Oh. I see. But anyway, I've been back since, and Lunchbox Laboratory is very good. So I come see. hungry. I see. All right, everyone. Well, Defy this coming Friday night. Make sure you check it out. Filthy and I are going to be hawking some shirts. Filthy's got some new shirts. So bring your wallet and ready to open it up. You're going to like these shirts, everybody. And come say hi to me and Vince and Rodney. That's right. Rodney's going to be here. That's right. So it's going to be a fun time, everybody. So check it out on Friday night, Defy. And that is it. We will talk to you again after a while. Good night. Adios.